Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on the theme of stepping forward by stepping back. I'm Robert Breeden. I'm a partner with Galvin WLG, and I'm delighted to be chairing this morning's webinar. I'm joined by three stars from the world of sport, specifically three elite stars from Team England. Firstly, David Weir. David is a British Paralympic wheelchair athlete. He won a total of six gold medals at the 2008 and 2012 Paralympic Games, a gold medal at the 2014 Commonwealth Games, and has won the London Marathon on eight occasions. Secondly, we're joined by Alice Tai. Alice is a British Paralympic, World, European, and Commonwealth champion para swimmer. Alice won gold at the Rio 2016 Paralympics and at the Gold, the gold Coast Commonwealth Games in 2018. Finally, I'm delighted to welcome Johnny Ryle. Johnny is the Paralympic head coach at British Triathlon and the Team England Triathlon team leader for the upcoming Birmingham Commonwealth Games. Johnny volunteered for Team England almost 20 years ago at the last home Commonwealth Games in Manchester and went on for, to have a successful career in sports that's been integral to the development of the UK's para triathlon program. Those of us working in business, industry or public services often look to sport for inspiration on how to tackle our leadership issues. What are the lessons we can learn from individual sportsmen and sportswomen? We want to understand their motivation, their perseverance, their discipline and their character. And then we try to apply that to our own work, don't we, in many ways. And equally, we look enviously at the great sports coaches and we wonder how they get the best from their teams. What can we learn about how to get our own teams working together smoothly and successfully? The changed working environment over the past two years has presented us with even more challenges in maintaining our own performance and indeed challenges for leaders who strive to help their colleagues to keep going and to stay focused. And it's tempting, isn't it, to encourage our teams to keep moving forward, to dig a bit deeper, to buckle down, and everything will be just fine. But this morning, we're going to explore the importance and the benefits of taking a step back, to pause and to reflect, to ask ourselves what truly motivates us and to see whether a new perspective might reconnect us with our purpose. And in doing so, perhaps reinvigorate our enthusiasm for the work we do. In a moment, I'm gonna ask our panel to explore this theme of stepping forward by stepping back. And firstly, we're gonna hear about some of their experiences and their own reflections. We'll then open up the conversation and explore some thoughts on how we can apply this in our daily work. And finally, um, we'll open up to some questions from the audience um, for the last five or 10 minutes. We're aiming to close the webinar just before 11 o'clock this morning. Um, and just to let everybody know, we are recording the webinar and that, that the details of that will be circulated to everyone afterwards. So David, can I turn to you first and, and start with your own experiences, please? Perhaps you could talk us through a time when you needed to step back in order to be able to move forward. What were the circumstances and what did you learn from that? Um, my experience goes back to, uh, I had a big, big experience in, in, in Rio where uh, I, I didn't deliver and, um, and things happened in Rio that I, it was out of my control. And uh, when I got back, I, I couldn't deal with the, the, the situation. So my mental health, um plummeted really um because i felt like i was i was letting uh, a lot of people down um and myself down i just felt like i was a failure uh in life and i had to take a step back um from the sport i, I carried on training for about six or seven months after um i, I won london marathon the, the, the year after in 2017 but i had no feelings i didn't I didn't really enjoy um, the experience of the day. I didn't enjoy the, the feeling of winning. And I knew there was something seriously wrong. Um, so I had to take a step back and, and, and come away from the sport and really find um, who David Weir was and is. 
Um, and <laughs> it took me a long time to, to figure out uh, what I wanted to do. Uh, is it the sport that's making me depressed or, um, or is, it, is it me myself? So I had to really dig deep and it was, it was a tough time in, in my life. Um, there was a, it wasn't just sport that was up in the air. There was, there was home life that wasn't, wasn't great either. So it was just, yeah, you just feel like it's all you and, and you had no one else to blame. So that, that was my first sort of going back and sort of visiting who I was before I was a international Paralympic star. So, and I think it really goes back to the pressure of um, competing in 2012 as a home nation as well. Um, you know, being the, the lead star going into the games, I didn't feel no pressure. It was really weird. I, I, I just dealt with, dealt with it like it was a, a normal race. Um, it was only after that I felt the entire world was on my shoulders that I had to deliver every time I got on the track. I had to deliver when I got home to see my kids. I had to do, I just felt like I was doing it for everyone else and not myself. And I sort of realized that in 2017. And um, so I, I come away from the sport and try and find out what I wanted to really do. Do I want to retire? Do I want to carry on? And so it took, a, it, it took me a long time um, to figure out who I was really. Thank you, Johnny. I'm, I'm sure people will um, will have appreciated that that candor and openness around a, a clearly a difficult time, um, and that be, perhaps be surprised in some ways at that, that that such a key achievement in other people's eyes, and you didn't you didn't feel that on the on the day. That I think people find that um, surprising. We might pick that up with you later. Um, next, I'd like to bring in Alice. But Alice, before I um, we ask you to talk about a time when you've paused to reflect and, and think about motivation and purpose. Can I ask how you're doing after your recent operation? For those who may not know, Alice recently had her right leg amputated just below the knee, and many people will be keen to hear from you whether that was successful, Alice, and how you're, how you're getting on. Yeah, um, so that went great. Apologies, I'm sat on my sofa because I can't sit on the table, um, and I have this lovely blanket to keep my legs warm. Um, so apologies for that I feel a little bit unprofessional um, but yeah I just had my right leg amputated below the knee and it's gone couldn't have gone better I think um, I'm really looking forward to just kind of eventually getting a prosthetic and living my life again um, but yeah it's all gone really well well that's great that's that's good news so um, if we then turn to the theme for this morning um, how about your own experience and and times when you might have questioned your motivation when when was that for you and how did you deal with it so for me kind of the pinnacle where I really felt like I kind of just wasn't motivated and not enjoying sport was around Rio at the Paralympics I was 17 at the games and the two years going into them when I was 15 16 I was really losing my love for the sport and it was just a case of I'd been brought up loving it. And then as soon as a professional tint got put on it, I just felt like I disconnected from the reason that I started. And I was so excited to get the hat with the flag on with the Union Jack. I was so excited at the potential of winning medals that I really got washed up. And my mental health just plummeted. I remember I was in a hotel room at the trials for the Paralympics and I just, I didn't want to be there. I would go back into the room and just cry. Um, and I didn't even really want to go to the games. I quit swimming before that, before that competition, just because again, I needed to take a step back. And even though, so I took two steps back. The first one was before the trials for Rio where I quit swimming for three months and then went back to my old coaches from when I was a child and they slowly got me back in the pool. And I regained love for the sport, but not competitively. But I decided that I should go to Rio because I felt bad on my family and everyone who had invested so much time. And then after Rio, I took another huge step back again. And then 
we found swimming for myself and it took ages it's still it took a good year and a half before I was training again competing and enjoying it the same as when I was kind of 11 years old um, but taking that step back and just slowly relearning and learning to just enjoy again that was really the the main point for me that's great thank you Alice it's f fascinating that we our assumption isn't it when we see sportsmen and sportswomen like yourselves is is that that, that competitive element drives you but it was almost the at times they're the opposite for you. The, the, the competitive element was, was what was putting you off. It's, it's interesting. Um, Johnny, if I come to come to you then, as, as a coach, these examples sound like you, you, you could be effectively losing your elite, elite athletes just as they're coming into their own in the run up to, to big competitions and so on. And, and it's like that there may be some parallels with the challenges that some managers in the workplace are facing We've had record numbers of people leaving their jobs, this phenomenon known as the great resignation over the last couple of years. As a coach with a team of uh, sportsmen and sportswomen, how do you keep someone in the team to maintain that high performance whilst accepting, as we've heard from David and Alice, sometimes they just need to stop and to, to rethink. Do you, essentially, do you have to let them go sometimes to be able to bring them back? Yeah, I, I think the, the whole, the whole question is a fascinating one and um it's it's amazing listening to to dave and alice because those those scenarios are really common um i have athletes who exist in our team who have had ex exactly the same scenarios and i think uh, everybody would recognize the the challenge of trying to be the best athlete in the world um and i guess the way that i've often referred to it is it's there's an enormous physical toll that an athlete has to put their body through, which is quite rare. And, and normally as humans, we tend to shy away from stuff which hurts and these guys put themselves through that hour after hour, day after day. Um, but you also have someone's hopes and dreams ultimately in your, in your hands and your responsibility. Now, um, I have never been an elite athlete, but I tried to really understand what my role was and, and I guess front up to the responsibility that you have when you lead a team. Um, so my, my role's been called head coach for a long time. And I guess a lot of people think you stand with a stopwatch and a clipboard and, um, you know, you might go into a lab and work with a physiologist and, and all of that stuff happens. But I guess the, the, the biggest um, sort of eye opener to me is that every single decision you make, every single behavior that you allow to either happen or not happen impacts on people's lives. So I would, would say I probably spend the best part of 60, 70% of my time, probably not on some of the, the quite detailed athletic work. And it's about, it's about culture and it's about what it feels like to be a member of this team. So um, I'll tell the shortest of stories just, I think, to, to bring it home and it, it adds the stories that Dave and Alice have told. So um, in the lead up to Rio, it was the first Paralympic Games that we were going to participate in triathlon, made its debut in Rio. And we identified an athlete through a talent ID program in 2014. Uh, two children, family, really similar age to me. Um, so at that point in time, sort of about 30, had a really good job as an engineer at Airbus and earned a good living. Um, hopes and dreams are powerful things. And, you know, we, we said, we think you've got some talent and we think you could you could be pretty special in this sport. Um, I could miss out tons of detail and tell you the bit where he won in Rio and he did, he came home with a gold medal. Um, the toll on his mental health to accelerate his learning from being a family man, having a good income and a stable income, to being in a world which is incredibly unstable. Like David said, you know, you feel the pressure to, to deliver every time and that's, that's never, um, it's never always achievable, it's never possible. Um, I mean, in Paralympic sport, especially, we are um, we are kind of governed by people's classifications and that's not stable either. So two years post games, uh, that athlete was told his classification wasn't going to represent in Tokyo. And in effect, he lost his job. Um, and, and I tell that story to a lot of our staff and to a lot of people who want to work in our world, because I guess for you and I, Robert, you do a good job at work and you hope that you carry on that, the, the next day. Um, and actually in this athlete's world, he did the very best job he could um, and it still wasn't a stable world. So um, I, I can add a little bit more detail as we go on. But I think for me, the key thing um, that I can do 
is to tell athletes that it's it's not only is it fine to step back, we're going to make you at times. Um, and I get I guess the parallel that I draw, um, and there's a lot of I think there's a lot of learning in this is we would never say to David, right, what we want you to do today is to go out at 6 a.m. We want you to push your chair as hard as you can till 10 p.m. Like do it again tomorrow, do it again tomorrow, do it again tomorrow because you break. But almost the the mindset that can kind of creep in in performance sport is that your mind is having to push and push and push and push. So in the same way that we would write a plan which has peaks and troughs, you would have recovery time in there, you'd feed it with great nutrition, you'd hopefully have a fantastic physio to help stop injuries. We have to do the same when it comes to people's mental health. So I think um, the, the thing that I actually wrote earlier is it's it's absolutely fine for athletes to step back. But I guess in my role, it's absolutely not fine if that's as a consequence of the system that they exist in, if that's happening with athlete after athlete after athlete, because ultimately you're chasing this, this kind of dream of medals, which is an interesting thing in itself. Um, for me, that isn't all right. So yeah, the, the attempt to try and create systems and cultures, bring people in, invest money into areas to really try and support athletes to plan what else are they good at in life? What other support systems do they have? Um, and another analogy, just listening to those two there, it's like a roller coaster, you know, and it's a roller coaster can be exciting, can be really good fun when you're on it. You probably wouldn't want to be on it 24 hours a day, but what does somebody have to get off when they get off that roller coaster? What do they have? What support systems do they have? Um, and if they don't have any, that's when you can see real troubles. So we, we try and put in place things to, to kind of mandate, if I'm being really honest, that people do spend time and energy and we support that time and energy uh, to make sure people have got other things than, than simply the, the, I guess, the chase for a, a performance on medal. That's great. Thank you, Johnny. I might, I might come to um, David and Alice. I was, I was struck by your, your story of the, the, the athlete and that uncertainty and the change in the classifications, Johnny. So there's, there's, there's it sounds like that that uncertainty is is almost part of the the the, the life of the sportsman and sportswoman. So perhaps David and then Alice, how, how do you keep your focus when you've got those uncertainties going on around you? Um, for me, I, I'm I'm okay because I'm in the, the the toughest class and it doesn't get changed much. So <laughs> I'm all right with it, the, the classifications, but I have to deal with it on a daily basis at my academy. So now I add. Uh, an athlete is a T33, which is um, uh, brain injury, cerebral palsy, stroke, cerebral palsy class. Um, and he got to Tokyo. You know, he, when he started, people said he would never make it to, to a Paralympics. He'd never be a GB athlete. So it was the biggest achievement of his life. And, and now there's no competition for him. So now you've got to, you know, keep him energised, keep him focused and, um, and funny enough, we, we've got a, a sponsor that sponsors our academy and um, they're not just giving us money and helping, they're actually giving job opportunities for athletes as well. And if he didn't have this other avenue, I think it would have broken him even more because he felt like he, he's achieved and then not overachieved. So I have to deal, deal with it at the academy, but he's dealt with it very really well because he's got other opportunities and he's got a job, but he still loves training and still loves races. There's still going to be races for him, but at the moment it's been pulled from, from um, Paris. So it, it's, it's tough on the, on the, on the weaker classes. It's, it's really tough. Um, and, you know, we, we have to deal with it on a daily basis at our, our academy and we try our best and try and help them mentally as well and physically. So there's something about life outside the particular event there, isn't there? And, and, and Alice, in your perspective, I know you've, you're, you're passionate about using your sport as a, almost as a platform for, for other areas of interest. Is that, is that how you keep your focus or is that something else that comes into play? Yeah, I'm, I often describe myself as having too many baskets and not enough eggs um, because I try and try and do too many things um, because I enjoy having a lot of variety. But I, I also talk to a lot of the younger athletes coming up and make sure that they understand the importance of having a balance. When I was at school, my GCSEs and everything, although 
they were still important. They were very much pushed to the side. It was kind of, oh, is there a camp on at this point? Okay, well, we'll organize it so you can sit them abroad instead of, well, what would, what would you rather do? Would you feel more comfortable doing them with everyone else? Kind of just how they should be done normally. And I just, I stress to the younger athletes just the importance of that. And again, going back to classification, it's, it's so unpredictable. Um, and there have been athletes who have gone from being first in the world, world record holders in their class, predicted golds at the next games to moving classifications. And then the next month they're deselected from programs. And that's the end of their career in the sport. So it's it's extremely fickle and it's kind of terrifying because you can only do the best you can do. And with the fear of being moved out of a classification when you're not competitive, there's also the fact that people can come into your classification. So one of our athletes, he stayed, he stayed in the same one. He won a gold medal in Rio. And then he didn't even get selected for the team in Tokyo because he wouldn't have finaled because everyone in that final had been moved from another classification. So it's just, it's so unpredictable. So having other things to do is, it's a must in sport. And I think the culture is getting better and people are realizing and that's, I'm happy about that. So, so, so perhaps Johnny pick up with you there's something isn't there about you, you talked about the support network and we've heard about the importance of uh, um, recognizing the the, the, the 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 fickle nature of it all as, as Alice said so in terms of keeping people motivated we often in, in the business world people talk about whether you're going to uh, use um, in more of a supportive style praise and encouragement some people respond to more of a tougher approach what 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 how do you how do you use that with teams and, and and the different styles of approach you might take yeah i think the first thing to acknowledge there isn't anything there isn't a right or wrong here um we've got an athlete on program and he'll say he'll say to me look when i'm down i just want you to be horrible i just want you to be mean i want you to give it to me straight and i, I actually really struggle with that so I'll, I'll hold my hands up my style is, is incredibly supportive um, for all the reasons that I've said, because I acknowledge that the fact that this will, it, it adds pressure. It is pressure implicitly. So um, I think a lot of the time there isn't a massive need to add any more. Um, and then also, I guess um, you have to take this into context. So you go back, um, uh, let's say 30 years, and Britain weren't very good at sport. We didn't win many medals. So at the time, there was a, a really... Um, there was a change in the guard required and there was people who needed to step through and, and really, really push boundaries. Whereas I think what you see now is we're very, very good at sport and athletes who come into the world of elite sport want to win races. I don't think I see many people who don't want to at least try and win races. So um, I don't see in, in my world, there is a massive need to, to play a really strict hand a lot of the time. Um, I think that's too simple. I think it's far too simple to look at it as you're either one thing or the other. So um, there's a phrase that I like to, to kind of st stick to a lot of the time. So it's culture, each strategy for breakfast. I'm not the first person to say that. I certainly won't be the last. So we create a culture which drives excellence and we're very upfront about that. We're not here to try um, to let people float through their athletic career. Um, but what we don't talk is about we're not a culture where we're trying to win medals. They're very different things. So actually, you can become the best athlete in the world and, and you might not medal. You might not go to the games, but that striving, that the aspiration to try and be the best is, is a fulfilling one. And similarly, and we've seen many of these people, you might win lots of medals at the Paralympic Games and never be your best, never need to be your best. So we are about excellence. And we're very proud of that. Um, but then we're incredibly people focused. So I, I guess answering your question, um, what we try and do is have a, we call it an individual athlete approach. It's one of the pillars of our culture, I guess. So we can challenge each other as staff. Are we, are we asking an athlete to do that because we just want them to, because it's easier for us? Or are we actually taking an approach about what's best for them? And, and Alice give a, a fantastic example in the exams and the GCSEs. What is best for that person long-term to enable them to try and deliver excellence in, in all areas of, of their life. And um, 
but I guess for me, the bit that you can't shy away from here, so culture, I'll go back to, that needs to exist with everybody. And it's not good enough for people to say they get it. They need to show day in, day out, they get it. And, um, and, and if, you don't, if you don't get it, you're never gonna, you're never gonna be consistent in the way that you lead your teams. Um, so being really honest, we have removed staff from our team because they just don't get it. And we have recruited based upon a set of behaviors that we want to see, that we think will help support the culture we want to deliver. So having the right people in place, first and foremost, is, is pretty critical. And I would say if you don't get it, there is ways that you can. You know, you just need to broaden your horizons, speak to people, listen, really understand what that world is like for that person. Because um, a lot of the time, I think there's a lot of assumptions when people are under pressure. So um, the, the things that really stand out for me in, in our world, there is a commitment there. We've worked really hard over the, the last 10 years to make sure we have the right people. Anybody new coming in is assessed against that culture. Um, and I guess words are, are fine, they're, they're one thing, but support is needed in this because actually the, the biggest challenge I think I've found is trying to get an athlete sometimes to step away from the pool or the gym or the track or the road, wherever they're training that day and give some time back for themselves. And sometimes there is a, a real educational piece, again, exactly like Alice said, to take younger athletes and help them understand why they should invest in themselves from day one. And then that investment part, again, time is fine, but having some support and having money behind that. So even if I look broader at British Triathlon, we have a head of culture and people development that exists in our uh, wider organization. We, had a head, we have a head of culture and people development that exists in our performance uh, team. So it's two different people. We have an investment that runs across so people can get money to, to pay against things that they may want to, do, to invest in themselves, CPD, et cetera. Um, and even if I just look at my experience as a staff member, um, do I always take it? I, I'm probably honest, I don't. But every every Wednesday, it's an expectation that you don't work. Every Wednesday afternoon, sorry, not Wednesday. So two o'clock onwards, from two o'clock till five o'clock, we have a block out meeting in our diaries, which is your own CPD. It's called transition time. Let's play on triathlon words there. But it's basically come up with a plan. And that is your time within your work time. We're not expecting you to do this when you go home to your families um, to invest in you. Um, and again, the hardest thing is getting people to commit to that. So it's a, it's a bit of a juxtaposition. You know, you've got to give the, the opportunities, but you've really got to help people to understand what it's there for. So it's it's not one thing. It's it's a bit of everything. But I guess it's it's about the individual and, and what they need. I'm hoping there are no members of my team listening and going to try and persuade me to have every Wednesday off now. But, uh, um, uh, so you, you, you've explained, uh, I think, there the, 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 the focus is on doing your best, isn't it? The, the, not, not, not necessarily winning a medal. It's about performing to your best and, and, then, and then seeing the individual um, and all the aspects of their life and, and, and giving that support network. That's coming across very powerfully. I'll come to David and Alice just to see whether that resonates with them in a moment. I just encourage people who are who are on the webinar we're, to open up the we'll, we'll open up the QA section now. So if you've got any questions for for our panel this morning, perhaps start to pop those in the QA and we can pick those up in the in the second half. But but David, I come to you first. But Johnny's description there of that sort of wider support network and the, the culture, does that is that resonating with you? You can can you see that? Yeah, I can see that. Um, I just don't think I use the uh, avenue to the best as, uh, of my ability so I've sort of relied on my coach for everything as my um, friend as my you know like you said sometimes she could be hard sometimes she could be you know put an arm around me when I needed it uh, my sports psychiatrist everything you know so it was it, you know it was only till I was really depressed that I found that I had to go and talk to someone that didn't really know me and, and didn't understand me. Um, and away from the sport, I felt like I had to go and speak to someone that was really didn't even have interest in sport. And um, and it was nice to open up to someone that I think she did know me in the end, but at the beginning she didn't realise who I was. Uh, it was only till I explained what I'd done and, and then she realised. So I think it just depends on the person as well. Um, some people need, you know, you know, we've got athletes at my academy where you have to be a little bit hard because they won't train mm. or 
you, you, but then sometimes later on when you when you can see they've put in a lot of effort in, you've got to put an arm around them and, and, and praise them. So, you know, I've learned from, from my coach the, the, the way uh, she taught me and um, and I, I'm trying to do it with, with the academy athletes that I've got, young, old, whoever comes in. But you have to do it on an individual basis. You can't treat everyone the same. Um, and I've only realised that when I've, you know, step back from my career I know I'm, I'm still racing fully but um, and, and when I set up the academy I, I expected every athlete to be like me <laughs> um, you know I train at 100 mile an hour I train like I race and um, and then I realized that not everyone's like that mm. so you have to really um, I, I just take a step back from the academy sometimes I just don't get involved in coaching I just sit back and watch and then evaluate what I need to do. And then I go and approach them and, and talk to them what they need. And um, for example, last night, we've got a, a, a new athlete, Marcus, who's a, in a 52 class, which is quite a low, low class. And he's been training for a year and he used to get very frustrated with, with pushing technique and coming out of his lane. And then last night I was watching him um, and he was, nailing it every time every time and he was staying in his lane and and i said it's because you sh you're, you we've shortened your stroke so you come in at the same time because of his disability if he lifted his arms up too too much at the back he would wobble everywhere so now he's, he's changed his stroke but it's taken time because we had to learn his you know we've told him the basis of of, of pushing um, and now he's learned his own technique that's working. And um, he was so happy with himself. And it, uh, it just, I just get a, a massive achievement. I'm doing something for the sport as well. I'm putting something back. So seeing these, these guys doing the sport that I love, I, I just get a, a, an absolute buzz out of it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Your, your, your example of how, how, you, um, how you came in and, and almost expected everyone to be at the same level. It reminds, I don't know whether this is true or not, but the stories of Glenn Hoddle as a coach at um, Tottenham, I think, where he, he couldn't understand why no one could cross the ball quite as well as he could. And uh, yeah. it, it's just recognising that, isn't it? And uh, trying to bring out the best in people. Um, Alice, perhaps your, your reflections on this whole piece about the, 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 the culture and the individual aspects to it. Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, just kind of piggybacking on what, on what Dave just said. I think within a team setting, it's really important to be able to listen, empathize, understand, and then support individuals in the way that they need, but then support them in a way that also benefits the team because no one's the same. And the beauty of working in group settings, whether it be sport or external to sport is that everyone brings their own strengths. And I feel like sometimes the ability to speak up and kind of not, not be vulnerable as such, but be able to be intact with your own emotions and communicate them without feeling like there are any consequences or that you're gonna be invalidated for them is super important. And once one person is able to speak to someone about that, then it kind of spreads. And I've seen it within para swimming, where the swimmers, when I was younger, the whole culture was very much, we're here to train. If you're feeling down, sweep it under the rug, don't bring it to the pool. Um, no one wants to know about it. Positive, positive, positive. But now the generation of athletes below me, they're very, very in touch with their emotions. And it's great because they'll speak, some of them will speak to me about how they're feeling or the staff. And the staff are also very in touch with it. If my coach, for example, if he's had a bad day at work, not at work, he's a coach, but just a bad day in general, um, and something's happened and he knows he's a bit, a bit naggy and a bit kind of on edge, he'll come to the session and just be like, I'm really sorry if I come across like this because I've just I've just had a rubbish day mm. and I just want to let you know because if I snap at you, it's not because you've screwed up as much as you think you have. Like it's it's really just I've had a bad day and so in advance. And that really helps because then if he does turn around and snap and everyone's kind of like, they didn't deserve that, 
it's almost like it doesn't justify it, but it makes it easier as a team to work through and then also support him. Yeah. So it's um, kind of a whole team culture of support. Yeah, that 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 change you describe, Alice. I think we're we're, we're seeing it increasingly in the in the workplace with the with the increased focus on health and well being and recognizing the um, the challenges that people have outside of the the, the workplace and that, and that that picks up Johnny's themes from earlier on, doesn't it? Did, Johnny, we had a question in the Q and A on the on the piece around culture, um, and you've mentioned the importance of agreeing that and you set the behaviors, you bring in the right people you even talked about perhaps excluding the people if they don't exhibit those um those behave behaviors so how was that culture determined in the outset how what was the process and did you did you engage with the the individuals and the athletes with it how, how did that come into come into play yeah I've, I've read that question it's a it's a really important question it's brilliant um the the thing our culture has become a really big thing in sport um mm as a consequence of, being, of there being pockets of not very good culture. Um, and the risk is that it's something decided upon a team as opposed to it being decided by a team. Um, and I, I'm not just trying to tell a story of, of, of where we did it well, but thankfully the approach we took, um, and this was back in sort of 2013, 2014, and it was a, a cross program, because again, I don't think you can have genuine culture and expect it to be different in different pockets. So. We're obviously the uh, head coach of the Paralympic program, but in that sense, we did it as a collective performance team, Olympic and para. So um, every single athlete and every single member of staff had a one-to-one -one, um, where we discussed this bit specifically. But rather than saying something really kind of lofty, with what would you like the culture to be and feel like here? We just had a really kind of honest conversation. And like Alice said, we just tried to listen. So we asked a few um simple but i think critical question so when you've been at your best what was happening for you what did it feel like around you what were the interactions with people like when you went to competition and camps and they went brilliantly why did they go really well not just practically but um interpersonally and then look when things haven't been <clears throat> haven't been working so well what did you see what changed what behaviors did you see from us what behaviors did you see from yourself um and it was a lot of work and there was a lot of I guess I haven't really rich data of, of people's opinions and thoughts and emotions. And we spent a decent sort of six months trying to pick through what we'd heard, themed them. We then ran a number of sessions where we basically took the big themes back to the team and said, look, this is in, in, in summary, this is what we think we've heard. This is a chance to check whether we are right or not. And, and if we're, if we're on the right page, we're going to now put our time and, and effort into the things that you've said help you. Um, and it just helped to summarize, I guess, you know, five key things, which, and they ebb and flow over time and they, you know, sometimes the wording changes, but it gives us a starting point and a commitment to say, can we hold ourselves accountable to delivering in this way? But that was athletes as well. It, I, I don't think it can be separate. So in, in this context, I don't think you can expect managers to do one thing and staff to do something completely different. You're all in it together. So yeah, it was. And, and you've, you've stressed there, I think that importance of the consultation and the collective buy-in and that collective willingness to hold one another to account sounds like that's really important yeah it's it won't work if you don't <laughs> okay um we've, we've had a, a a question in the uh, in the in the q a about um inevitably there's a this there's, there's significant pressure on the individual athletes personal pressure um and in in the workplace we're seeing more and more headlines at the moment about pressures in in, in work and burnout so Perhaps to David and Alice, what are the what are the techniques of dealing with that pressure? How do you how do you how do you cope with that? Are there any any particular um, techniques you adopt? I, I, it's a difficult one, really. Um, for me, if I know I've going into a big race, say London Marathon, if I know that I've done everything in my power to be the best I can be on that day I don't feel a lot of pressure but if I know things haven't gone quite right then I feel the pressure because people still expect me to win or do well so um, it just depends how the year's gone um, how the training's going um, loads of little things so if, if things are not going right, I sort of just say to myself, 
you you just got to do your best on that day and, and and do it for yourself and and that's what I've been saying you know since I you know I was diagnosed with with depression in in, in 2017 that you know every race now I do I do it for me I don't do it for anyone else um so that that's how I, I deal with it and I you know going back when we was talking about stepping back I I I just had to do it for myself and, and realized that I really wanted to to I had to enjoy the sport again um and I think that's a big thing in in the workplace as well you've got to enjoy it um and, and when you lose that enjoyment, that's why I went back and come back. Mm. And if you look at my record in a four-year cycle, after the Paralympics say in 2012, I didn't do the World Championships in Lille in 2013 because I couldn't physically and mentally get in that zone again to, to try and perform at the highest level. Um, I was absolutely shattered for for a good year, to be honest. Mm. And that And that... That year, I, I didn't really. I come fifth or sixth in the London Marathon, and that's when the pressure started to come because um, when you see negative um, comments on on social media or you know news outlets saying, "Is this the end of David's career?" <laughs> you know, and I, I, I've just won four gold medals at the biggest Paralympics ever. So, um, so now I sort of. I just do it for me and I, I really enjoy it and I'm happy yeah. in, in what so I'm you're, doing. you're almost sort of blocking out that external pressure. If the pressure's there, it's on your it's come from you rather than yes. the media. From, and, and yeah, yeah, from everyone else. And and like when I do my media stuff now, I, I always say I'm just doing it for myself and I'm happy with what I'm doing because you know now the comments are when are you gonna retire? So it's just like, you know, just give me a break a little bit. Yeah. But I, I just I just laugh it off now, and and uh, and and, I, and the question is, I I re I'll retire when I feel like I want to retire. Yeah. But before I come to Alice, David, you may have seen it. There's a question for you in the Q and A about that time you just when you were talking earlier on about <laughs> taking that step back, and you reflected. What were there any things that really helped you understand yourself and what you wanted? You, 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 clearly, there was a there was a lot going on. Um. At the time, I didn't know what I, want, I wanted. Um, the only thing that I felt was I, I, I could fix myself was was going away and enjoying my own company. Um, at, years ago, I, I didn't like being on my own. I always had to be with people or be with someone or ring someone. Or, and then I just found that I found peace when I was on my own and I could have my own thoughts and... Um, and that's what I really done, and and that's what worked for me. Um, it was a tough time because you was your I was on my own a lot, but I felt like when I was getting information or talking to friends or and then talking to my coach or someone else, I was getting so much information again, and it was just it was too much for me to cope with. So I just took myself away actually to the south coast a lot. Or, I just felt more comfortable by the sea. And funny enough, I, I met my partner two years ago and she was from Hastings. So it was, um, it, it all seems to all come together now. And uh, so for me, it was just being on my own and, and figuring out what I really wanted to do with myself and uh, enjoying, enjoying David Weir and not David Weir, the water racer. Yeah, fantastic. Alice, can I uh, come across to you? This, this question around the, the, the personal pressure that um, is particularly intense, I think, in this in the sports world. So, what techniques have you got for making sure that you're looking after yourself and not 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 allowing that pressure to 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 cause problems? Yeah, I worked a lot on this with my coach, and we decided instead of focusing on kind of the goal at hand, which was, I guess, medals in elite sport, we were just going to celebrate small successes. Mm -hmm. um so if I had a really excellent session or excellent day training then we wouldn't we make sure we acknowledge that because I think sometimes you get caught up in this huge end goal and it may seem like you're taking forever to get there and it's just constant kind of waves hitting you and hurdles but if you actually look at how far you've come already 
whether it's in a project or we're training leading into an event it's really kind of satisfying and rewarding just seeing that you've actually made progress already and I think in in times where I do reflect back it's normally when I'm starting to feel more stressed and more pressure and I tend to just chill just have whether it just be an hour half an hour a few minutes just to myself and just relax and then start again but acknowledge how far I've already come um, also with swimming when I when I get under pressure at competitions I kind of just stand there and look at the pool and I find it almost comical I just go well it's just a hole in the floor it's filled with chlorinated water I'm going to put on this weird kind of swimming costume and a bit of silicon on my head and just jump in. And that really, it, it grounds me a lot because it's just the bigger picture. It seems kind of strange when you think we've got <laughs> the rest of the world and then the whole universe and I'm just about to jump in this man-made hole of water. Um, so that helps just really assessing how kind of true or something can be. yeah so again there's something about that, that as david was talking about that sort of external pressure just saying that that's 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 not important this is just about my my achievements and i love your um your your analysis there about just celebrating the small steps the little the little wins so johnny um just perhaps try to draw some of that together you, you do you, you recognize that those styles and approaches you can see that in the in the team members that you're working with and is there anything else you wanted to any themes that we might draw draw this to a close with so. uh, yeah i'll try and keep it short i think mean, i see every single one of our team has something that they do and it's and it can be it can be different especially when we get to competition it's our it's our jobs to know those guys really well because some of them will want us to be around them they'll want a friend all the way to the start line some some will just want to be left alone but I guess where my head was going when when Alice and David were talking is this is this is um, sport to the extreme, right? But I guess trying to spin this round, if you take everything that that these guys do and just strip it back a little bit, actually the basics of exercise, the basics of good hydration, good food, um, is is so is so important when it comes to people's mental health now. The pressure and the external side of sport can sometimes strip that away. But I think from just a, a, a real personal view, um, you know, the, the toll of the last five years of trying to get, get a team to a game is will the games happen or not? What are we going to do if it doesn't? And then it's extended. And then all of a sudden now, all I get every day is the, the next games is less than three years away. You're two and a half years away. It's a year from qualification. And I, I, I still don't feel like I've really stepped off the plane from Tokyo. Um, like I came back tired, I wasn't eating well, I wasn't sleeping well, I wasn't exercising, and I was overweight. And um, the challenge then just to my mental health as, a, as a, an employee, as a worker, I could see immediately that there's some real basics. And uh, one, of our, one of our cultural bits is basics first, always. It's easy to think about all the special things you could do. And there's apps and there's mindfulness and all of this stuff. But if you just can move your body, treat it well, um, it'll look after you a lot more than if you don't. So I think, yeah, that, that's what I try and hang on to. It doesn't always work, but yeah, consistent with it. It's, it's a good start. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, well, we haven't got any more Q&A. So I think, I think we might draw things to a close there. So um, just to remains for me to thank you all for joining us this morning. And obviously particular thanks to David, Alice and to Johnny for sharing their experiences. Um, I've, I've, I've been particularly struck by your, your willingness and your, your openness, your candor to share, and it's been really, um, really motivating. And I'm sure those who have joined us this morning will, will take a lot of that away uh, with them. I think we've seen this morning the benefits of, as, as you've all described, of taking, taking that time just to pause and reflect, to examine our motivations. Um, and, and crucially for us all, I think, who have listened in this morning, we, we shouldn't be worried about taking that step back taking the time to reflect and 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 just picking up alice's theme just sort of, and then re-celebrating the small steps as we start to move move forward again so thank you all very much for your time it's been hugely um informative um and we're very grateful for your your time thank you thank you
you for listening. Yeah, thanks for having us. Okay. Thank you, everyone.